Shalom, friends. It's a delight to learn today with Do Dr. Marco Simkovich and to learn about letters from Hanukkah's and Purim's past, the establishment of minor holidays and Judea diaspora relations. Thank you for joining us for this wonderful session. Um, and, and good to see some friends and colleagues here. And it's nice to partner today with um, one of our great partners in Denver, the BMH BJ Synagogue. And I'm going to hand over the intro today to Rabbi Yaakov Chaitovsky. Welcome. Thank you very much, Rabbi Shmuley, and everyone else for being here. It's delightful to have you here. We're in for a real treat today. Dr. Malka Simkovich uh, is the Crown Ryan Chair of, Judaic, of Jewish Studies and the Director of the Catholic Jewish Studies Program at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. The author of uh, numerous academic uh, articles in uh, many journals, also the author of two books, The Making of Jewish Universalism, from Exile to Alexandria, and Discovering Second Temple Literature, The Scriptures and Stories That Shaped Early Judaism, uh, which received the 2019 AJL Judaico Reference Honor Award. Um, Dr. Sinkovich is involved in numerous interreligious dialogue projects, which help, which help to increase understanding and friendship between Christians and Jews, a noble and necessary effort uh, today, of course. Please give your attention to Dr. Simkovich. Thank you very much. I really appreciate those um, introductions and the work that uh, the Valley Beit Midrash and uh, Rabbi Chaitovsky put into making this event happen. And I'm very glad to see all of you. Thank you for making the time to come. Some of your faces are familiar and some of them I haven't yet met but I appreciate your being here. I wanna start by saying uh, something that you already might know, which is that Hanukkah, being the latest holiday on the Jewish calendar, is also the most difficult to understand. And what I mean by that is that for seven centuries or maybe even more, the meaning of Hanukkah was contested among Jews. Now, many of us who have celebrated this holiday know that there are two parallel stories about Hanukkah's origins that are often not put into conversation with one another. And of course, that's the miracle of the oil tradition, which is said to have originated in the early rabbinic period and the tradition of the successful Hasmonean victory against the Seleucid Greeks in 164 BCE. Um, and typically what Jews will say or what they learn if they've gone to a, a Jewish day school is that originally the origins of the holiday focused on the military conflict between the Seleucid Greeks and the Jews of Judea. And then over time, the rabbis who were uncomfortable with this tradition that valorized nationalism and um, rebellion uh, took that tradition and sort of suppressed it and uh, pushed another tradition to the fore. And that of course is a tradition that theologizes the story and highlights God's intervention in the lives of the people. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is that that might not be um, historically accurate. And I'm going to start by talking about the problems that the war posed for Jews throughout the Hellenistic world in the second century BCE. So first of all, we have a lot of evidence for the fact that Jews do not reach a consensus about why Hanukkah is important. We have the famous Talmudic passage in the tractate known as Shabbat, which you could date to the fifth or sixth century, where the rabbis say, my Hanukkah, why do we celebrate Hanukkah? And we don't have any parallel question that the rabbis ask about other holidays. The other holidays seem rather, um, rather transparent, with the exception, by the way, of the new year, Rosh Hashanah, which is not really a biblical holiday. It's mentioned in Leviticus, um, but it's not mentioned as a new year or a time of the judgment of the world or a commemoration of God's creation. It's called the Yom Tru'ah, unclear what that means. Uh, but really Hanukkah is unique in the fact that in the Amoraic era, in the era of the rabbis, there's still debate over why this holiday is being celebrated. But that's not the only evidence that we have for utter confusion about this holiday. Perhaps the best evidence that we have for the fact that Jews simply do not know how to commemorate it or what to focus on is the fact that it goes by so many names in the second temple period. 
Hanukkah is not a word that appears in Second Temple literature, as far as I have found. It is a rabbinic term. It means dedication, and it commemorates the dedication of the temple in 164 BCE. But in the Second Temple period, Jews are using all kinds of names for Hanukkah. They're calling it um, the Days of Tabernacles of Sukkot in Kislev. And one answer for that uh, name could be the fact that the Jews, when they recovered control over the temple in the winter, the most recent holiday that they had not celebrated was Sukkot. Um, it could have to do with the fact that the prophet Zechariah associates something with the menorah uh, and the temple uh, with uh, some sort of a winter solstice festival. I mean, there are all kinds of hints that you could call from the book of Zechariah associating the menorah with some kind of winter festival. All of this is very unclear. It's sort of shadowed. We don't really have strong evidence uh, for why we um, why we know that Jews are calling this holiday Tabernacles and Key Slave. But other Jews are not calling this holiday Tabernacles and Key Slave. They're calling it the Days of the Purification. Now, it's called the Days of Purification before we find any evidence of a tradition of the oil miracle. So we don't know what, it could be that it's the Days of Purification um, that, you know, references sort of the reclamation of the temple. It's unclear what, why is it called purification? We don't know. Other Jews are calling it lights, and we know that they're calling it lights from the late first century CE historian Josephus, who has very good sources for the war between uh, the Hasmonean rebels and the Seleucid Greeks. And he definitely has a book that you might have read or know about called One Maccabees, which is preserved in the Apocrypha and the Catholic canon. And Josephus has very, very good sources. He knows what happened in terms of the military conflict. But he doesn't know why Jews call it lights. And we have a very interesting passage that I, I don't have on the source sheet today, but I could send it to you if you email me, where Josephus goes through in incredible detail all the ins and outs of the war. Um, and then he says, and Jews commemorate this story every year, and they commemorate it with this holiday that they call lights. And I suppose that we call it lights because we were in a state of figurative darkness and we thought that we would be annihilated and that our traditions would be taken from us. And then God uh, reversed our fortunes and did a miracle. And so um, light came into our lives. Now, the problem with that is that you can apply that allegory to really almost any Jewish holiday on the calendar. It really is not specific to Hanukkah. And so it's kind of this thing where, um, you know, I used to teach many years ago, I used to teach middle school. And when I would ask my students, uh, why do you see repetition in this verse? They would say, I don't know, for emphasis. It's just like a fallback answer that feels right. Like, I don't know, two words look like for emphasis. Um, so I feel like Josephus is doing that. Like, I don't know, lights, it was bad, then it was good. Uh, but Josephus does not know. Josephus doesn't know why we call it lights. And so by the end of the first century, we have a very, very weak transmission when it comes to the origins of Hanukkah. And this weak transmission suggests that there was debate among Jews, regardless of where they lived. And that uh, debate boiled down to the question of, what are we really celebrating when we celebrate this, this holiday? That very debate suggests that there were traditions circulating well before the rabbis start writing, and that those traditions might have offered an alternate understanding of the holiday that might not have been centered on the war itself. And we're going to look at some sources uh, in a few minutes that suggest that um, it's far more complicated than saying, well, in the Second Temple, they talked about the war and the rabbinic era, they talked about the miracle. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. And we're going to look at some sources that suggest that. We, before we go to those sources, I want to say a little bit more about the historical realities of the second century BCE. If you've heard me teach about this period uh, before, this is going to be review um, because I begin many of my talks uh, with the following facts. First of all, it's important to keep in mind that by the second century BCE, the vast majority of Jews are not living in the land of Israel. This is hugely important for understanding the geopolitical situation in Judea. In other words, when the Judeans attain autonomy from the Seleucid Greeks, it's not obvious that this is a Jewish story. Right. Just like if something really, really, really good were to happen to the Jews in Israel, or even arguably, oh, I hate to make this comparison, but the establishment of the state of Israel, it was a huge controversial question. 1948, is this a story about all the Jews, regardless of where they live? Right. Should every Jew say hello? Uh, should every Jew add special prayers to celebrate this 
uh, this establishment, it wasn't immediately clear to the Jews um, all over the world that they should be commemorating something that did not immediately impact them. And so if you zoom back in your mental timelines to the sixth century BC, this is the era of the Babylonian exile. And you recall that at the end of the sixth century BCE, the Persian empire defeats the Babylonians in around 538 BCE. And the, the uh, benevolent King Cyrus says to the Jews, the, the Judeans, we don't say Jews yet, the Judeans in exile, you can go back to the land of Israel, you can go back to Judea and reestablish a society there that's Judean and rebuild your temple. This is where we see um, a beginning of a totally new reality. And what I would even say is the beginning of the transition from Judeanism to Judaism, by which I mean, it's at this moment when Cyrus says, you can go back to Judea, that the Jews say, well, maybe we can still retain our ancestral identity without going back. Because the majority of Judeans do not take Cyrus up on his offer. And some of them stay in what's now Persia, or they move, but they don't go to the land of Israel. They go to the Levant. They go along the coastal lines of the Mediterranean. They go to North Africa. They go to Greek islands. They go to Antioch, to the north of the land of Israel, but they don't go back to Judea. And so when we enter into the Hellenistic era around 312, well, it's 323 when Alexander the Great dies and he takes over the Persian empire and this is sort of the beginning of Hellenism, um, it's at this moment that um, it becomes very apparent that Jews are not just living all over the world, but they're living under these subcultures. Because when Alexander the Great dies, he does not leave a will. And so there are uh, generals who are contesting for control over various parts of his empire. And then we have a uh, transition into three very different Hellenistic kingdoms, and they all have different personalities. And so the Ptolemaic Hellenistic kingdom in North Africa is very, very different from the Antiochid kingdom in Asia, which is very different from the Seleucid kingdom to the north. Um, to the north. And so my question to you is, what's right in the middle of that? What is the little dot that's right in the middle of the Seleucid kingdom and the Antiochid kingdom and the Ptolemaic kingdom? I don't know if you can unmute yourselves. It's Judea, right? Of course it's Judea. Judea is the trade route. Judea is this coveted tiny sliver of land that everybody wants. Now, most of the time from 323, or rather 312 to 200 BCE, Judea is under Ptolemaic control. And under the Ptolemies, they have a relatively... Um, uh, they have a, a relatively large amount of what we would call religious freedom. They can practice their ancestral laws the way that they want. As long as they pay taxes, the Ptolemies are fine with them. The problems don't start with Hellenism. The problems start with the Seleucid Hellenists. In other words, we are not talking about a culture clash between all Greeks and all Jews. We are talking about some Greeks and some Jews. And this is very important to keep in mind. Okay, so when Judea falls under Seleucid control, because the Ptolemies and the Seleucids are fighting each other for this territory for the entire third century BCE, almost, there are a series of wars called the Six Syrian Wars, and they're battling for Judea. Once Judea really falls to the Seleucids, and the Seleucids have a different approach towards how to treat their little conquests, their, their little crying kingdoms, that's when the problems begin. So speaking about Judaism versus Hellenism is really a false binary. It just does not correlate with the history that we have because the Jews are living for 150 years under Hellenist control before we get the story of Hanukkah. And so in 175, Antiochus for Epiphanes becomes king and he issues this legislation prohibiting the observance of ancestral law in Judea. And, and now we have the famous story of the Jewish rebellion and the unlikely victory of the Jewish people. So the question is, when in 164, the Jews in Judea attain control over the temple, is this a holiday that every Jew throughout the Hellenistic world should celebrate? This is a very controversial question. And not all Jews agreed on the question. So what Jews, what Jews in Jerusalem, Jewish leaders in Judea did, is they said, we are going to proactively make a case for the global, I know that when I say global, I'm not, I don't mean the whole world, but I mean the Hellenistic world that they knew for a global observance of Hanukkah. And they had to make their case. So today we're going to look at two letters that are from Judea that we think are authentic. For sure the first one, uh, 
there's scholarly consensus that this was actually dispatched to diasporan Jews. And these letters are specifically sent to Jews living in Egypt. That's not a random location. Jews in Judea had particular interest in the Jewish community in Egypt. We're a small group, so maybe I'll just invite you to unmute if you're interested in participating more dialogically. Why do you think the Jews in Judea would have, there were Jews all over. There were Jews in Persia, right, to the east. There were Jews in Antioch to the north. There were Jews, um, there would soon be Jews in Rome, but there were Jews in the Italian peninsula, right? So why were Jews in, in Judea so concerned specifically about the observance of the Jews in Egypt? There are a few reasons. Yeah, well, they yeah. were much closer, much, much closer than I any of the other communities yeah. you mentioned. And furthermore, there was probably people going back and forth, you know, uh, between Judea and Egypt. It wasn't that long a journey. Okay. So, uh, so, but it's, and okay, and then maybe I'll ask next time. I, I did say to unmute, so it's fine. And then we'll go to Sam. Um, so you're right. It's close, but it's not the closest because you do have very large community of Jews in Antioch. And it was easier to get to Antioch than to cross the Sinai Desert and to get to Egypt. So it's a huge population. It There is um, there sure? is migration in both directions. So there are Jews going back and forth. The classes are in the bathroom. Okay, now I'm gonna have to ask, yeah, thank you. Um, so there is interaction, there's cultural interaction. But it's not the closest. Okay, so now, yeah, let's go to Sam. Oh, I was just thinking uh, one of two things. Yeah. First, that um, Alexandria was in some ways the great intellectual capital of the Jews, you know, the sort of New York of its day. And the other, the, the uh, Egyptian Jews had had the chutzpah to build a temple, so they might be more of a threat of breaking off and doing their own thing, although that was in the past. No, that's that's spot on. That's exactly right. Um, Alexandria is the crown jewel of the Hellenistic world. So it is like the New York of the ancient world, in the sense that culturally it was extraordinarily diverse, and yet it, it was producing, not and yet, and um, its diversity lend itself to a culture that was producing incredible um, uh, literature and art and and ideas and this is the heart of of where philosophy is is born and of course you, you'll you'll I'm sure be familiar with the great library it was actually libraries of Alexandria and yes Jews did not just have one temple in Egypt they had multiple temples in Egypt and one of those temples was standing in the second century um, in the Antopolis second century BCE and so here's the thing if you're a Jew in Judea, and you're, you know, you speak Aramaic, but you know some Hebrew, you went to school, you can read your scriptures in, in Hebrew, and you know Deuteronomy, and you've read it in Hebrew, you know that your eighth cousins in Alexandria, they only read their Bible in Greek, you know, I don't know if that's so authentic, hmm, they only read it in Greek, but I, my name is Miriam, I live in the suburbs of Jerusalem, and I can read my scriptures in Hebrew, and I speak Aramaic, and I see that in Deuteronomy, it says, that the Jews, the Israelites, once they were miraculously taken out of Egypt, they um, were instructed to never go back, right? That's what Deuteronomy says, you can't go back. But the reality on the ground suggests otherwise, right? The scriptures are very clear that the Israelites cannot go back to Egypt. And yet the Jews who are living in Egypt in Miriam's own time are enjoying extraordinary success, economically, socially, politically, they're rising the ranks of, of politics. We know that Cleopatra too in the late second century BCE had advisors who were Jewish. We also know that people were complaining about disproportionate Jewish power. You can make your own contemporary analogs if you feel like it. Um, but the point is, is that certainly this would have been disturbing to Jewish leaders in Jerusalem who might be uncomfortable with the fact that right nearby, there's up to a million Jews living in Egypt. Hundreds of thousands would be a conservative estimate. And these Jews are living in Egypt and they seem perfectly fine. <laughs> they're not being punished by God. No lightning bolt is striking them while they're walking to the grocery store. Not only that, but these Jews are not assimilated in the sense, okay, yes, they're imbibing Hellenistic culture. They're participating in cultural life, but they have not abandoned their ancestral laws, right? Whatever you learned about Hanukkah, if you went to Jewish day school and you learned that, oh, if you lived outside the land of Israel, you were inauthentic and you did not observe ancestral laws, it's simply a falsity. These Jews, many, many, many of them are observing Shabbat, right? Sabbath circumcision. 
dietary lot. They're reading their scriptures in Greek, but okay. They're reading and they're interpreting their scriptures and they view themselves as inheritors of an authentic tradition, pietistic tradition. And so these Jews who are openly observing as uh, Jews and they're participating and succeeding um, also in their diaspor uh, diasporic culture are a little bit of a thorn in the side of, of Jerusalem leaders. And so these leaders in Jerusalem write letters and they say in these letters, we really, really want you to keep Hanukkah. And not just because it's important to be an observant Jew and do, do Judaism the way that we do it, but because observing Hanukkah um, is, and this is where we get into the question of what does Hanukkah mean, is an affirmation of the legitimacy of the Jewish nationalist project. Of, of And not only that, but of God's divine intervention to the destiny of Judean life. All right, Jenny has a question. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry I don't have the uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter or verse, so I'm, I'm doing this from memory. Was there also an issue that Jews in Babylon also felt that um, sort of they they were fulfilling the Torah um, because they 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 had the Torah and they didn't need the lamp. That being um, they're being in Babylon and, and the rabbis in Babylon, Babylonia said, you know, Babylon is is good is as good as Israel. You don't have to return to Judea or Israel uh, to uh, sort of fulfill, you know, God's covenant. Uh, being in Babylon is just as good. And so I'm wondering if that also um, is playing a role here. That's a great question, but that material comes much, much later. So the rabbinic period, oh my gosh, the sun, of course the sun is setting because I'm in Chicago and it's 2.30 p.m. I might have to get up and close a curtain. Um, so the, um, the rabbinic texts that legitimize rabbinic life outside the land of Israel um, post-date this period. We do not have the literature that Jews in uh, what would now be Persia produced in the second century BC. So the effort to legitimize diaspora um, as a rabbinic project comes much later. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at these letters. These letters are appended to a work called Two Maccabees, not to be confused with One Maccabees. One Maccabees and Two Maccabees are both very different books. They are both accounts of the Hasmonean Rebellion, but written by two very different people with different approaches. One Maccabees is produced in Hebrew in the land of Israel, probably commissioned by the Hasmonean family, and really focuses on the heroism of the Hasmoneans uh, at a time, it was written in the late second century BCE. And uh, this is at a time where the legacy of the Hasmoneans is sort of being called into question by um, Hellenization in the family of the Hasmoneans. So 1 Maccabees is a formal account of the war that valorizes the family. Uh, 2 Maccabees has much less interest in the Hashmonaim and the Hasmoneans. Uh, 2 Maccabees was written in beautiful Greek by a diasporan Jew. And uh, it focuses on God's intervention uh, and God's role in the story. So it's much more, I guess you would say, spiritualized or theological. And an editor in the first century BCE who was copying two Maccabees had access to two letters that were written by Jerusalem leaders to Egyptian Jews. And he took these letters and he put them at the beginning of two Maccabees. So any book of two Maccabees today that you open up, does not open up with the ancient book of two Maccabees. It opens up with these letters. The first 10 verses of two Maccabees is one letter. And then chapter one, verse the second ver half of verse 10 through chapter two, verse 18, that's letter number two. And then the book of two Maccabees begins. But these are all written by three different individuals. And it gets even more complicated because the version of two Maccabees that we have is actually not the original work. It's a condensed version of an original five volume work that is now lost. We don't have that anymore. So even two Maccabees is not really two Maccabees. We have the original that's gone and then we have a condensed version. Uh, we're going to focus on the two letters. So I'm going to share my screen um, and I'd be very glad to um, email this to anyone who's interested um, or I don't know if uh, you could, I don't know if it was posted online. It might've been. Okay, so was it posted online? Can you, anyone want to nod and tell me whether they have this? I just put a, a link in the chat for anyone who'd like to open it. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. All right, so I'm just trying to figure out where to put my face. Okay, all right. 
So here you should see a timeline. This is a little timeline of events, important or interesting events that take place in the late second temple period. And now we're going to get started. Oh, I see. Thank you for putting that in the chat. Um, and so this is letter number one. That is a mistake. I can't believe I dated it to 124 BC. It's, it's a mistake, but it's not a dumb mistake because this letter embeds a letter inside of it. Um, and that letter is dated to 124. So this letter is actually dated to 143 and it cites a letter, 169, it cites a letter that was written in 143 BC. Okay, this is going to get confusing, but I'm going to, I'm going to clarify it to you. It is very, very rare to have a dated document. So we are very lucky that the writers of this letter decided that they should date it. But of course, there's no, year zero doesn't exist. And there's also... 164, right? That would have been meaningless. Uh, they're not counting down to the year one. Uh, so how do they count? How do they date this letter? Well, they date it from the beginning of the Seleucid period, which technically, uh, even though Alexander the Great dies in 323, I think um, the Seleucid era begins, or it was thought to have begun in 312 BC. So they're counting down from 312. So when they say at the end of the letter, this is the year 188, if you do 312 minus 188, Oh my God, I was right. I was, I, wait a second. It is 124. I'm sorry. You know, I've had two cups of coffee, so I can't even blame it on that. 312 minus 188 is 124. They're writing in 124. They're citing a letter from 169, which for us is 143. This is all going to be important as we discuss the letter. Because if they're writing in 124 BCE, that's about two generations, one and a half generations after the war. And so it's at this point where Jewish leaders, they might not have been witnesses or maybe they were kids when the war took place. But now they're losing. It's kind of like today when we talk about Holocaust survivors, like you're losing the tradition from the eyewitnesses. And so there's a worry, like, how do we carry on these stories? We're losing that that firsthand account generation. And so we have to really make sure that we can be confident in a cohesive narrative, because as we lose that first generation, uh, we don't want there to be debate over what happened. And so it's 124 BCE and the leaders in Jerusalem say, we got to contact our kin in Egypt and make sure that they know what Hanukkah is all about. And so they do that. And, um, and they say to our brothers, the Jews of Egypt, and structurally, we think that based on the fact that it opens up with the name of the audience and then it identifies um, the writers that we think that this was originally written in a Semitic language, either in Aramaic or Hebrew. Um, and so they say, because if it was in Greek, it would have started with identifying the writers and then and then identifying the uh, audience. Okay, to our brothers, the Jews of Egypt, greetings. Your brothers, the Jews in Jerusalem and in the land of Judah, you can insert right to you. And here we have something very interesting, which is a very, very long blessing. It was typical in ancient Hellenistic letter writing to open up with a bracha, with a blessing. But to have a blessing that's literally half the size of the letter is very unusual. And so half of this letter is a blessing, right? a good piece that also translates nicely into Hebrew, shalom tov, may God make for you, may he be good to you, may he remember his covenant with his faithful servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now I detect a little bit of underhanded criticism or concern May God give you all a heart to revere him and to do, I know it's very gendered, but this is the, it, it, we are doing he and him uh, in this letter. This is translated by Jonathan Goldstein. Um, it, it's actually a very, very good translation, but I know some of us might be not so comfortable with the gendering. I try when I talk about God not to do he and him, but that's what, that's what this translation is. That's what the Greek looks like. Okay. May he give you all a heart to revere him and to do his whole heart, his will for wholeheartedly and with a willing spirit. May God open your heart to his Torah and his commandments. I think it's very lovely language, but it also implies that their hearts are closed. May God open your heart, right? So what do you say to a kid? Like, may you learn how to be good. Uh, I, that's a terrible thing to say to a kid. I hope none of us do say that. But, right, there is an implication here that we have a problem. May God open your heart to his Torah and to his commandments. May God listen to your prayers and forgive you, right? Why do you say to someone, I hope you are forgiven? Because there's an implication that they require some level of forgiveness. May God not abandon you in an evil time. 
also a little bit strange. What was the evil time? Well, there was a little bit of turbulence for Jews in the late second century BCE in Egypt because Cleopatra too had entered into a civil war with her brother Fiscon. And there was a question of who the, who the Jews in Egypt should support. Should they support Cleopatra? Should they support his brother? But it's not clear to us. Is this a reference to um, something political? Or is it simply a reference to the fact that the Jews are um, bringing upon themselves or will bring upon themselves misfortune because they are not observing their laws properly? And now here we continually offer prayers for you. So this whole thing is one long blessing that suggests, well, you might not think that you're in trouble, but if you listen to us, you can be sure that we think you are, right? Something is amiss. And now they're going to reference an older letter. We wrote to you already, right? This is 124 BCE, right? For them, it's 188, but you do 312 minus 188, you get to 124. But back in 169 and 143 BC, we wrote to you 20 years ago, a generation ago. So maybe it wasn't exactly these writers. Maybe it was their older compatriots, but we wrote to you. And now the letter cites that older letter. We told you. To celebrate Hanukkah. How do they say that? They don't say celebrate Hanukkah. The word wasn't used yet. We we have this letter. We, we copied it. And we have a copy of the letter we sent to you. We never heard back. And this is what we said to you 20 years ago. In the affliction and in the distress that came upon us in the years from the time that the Hellenized Jew, Jason. I just inserted that adjective. Jason is a Hellenized Jew who was thought to have brought catastrophe upon the Jews because he was one of these figures in the early 2nd century BC who was a pro Hellenizer who was building gymnasiums in Jerusalem and actually getting into very murderous conflicts with other Jews uh, who did not want to Hellenize. And so the anti-Hellenist Jews hated Jason uh, and Jason comes up in one Maccabees and two Maccabees. But anyway, so in the distress that Jason essentially caused, right, when he reveled against the Holy Land and the kingdom and he set fire to the temple gateway and he shed innocent blood. This conflict, again, can be found in 1 Maccabees. We prayed to the Lord and God listened to us. So we brought sacrifices. We celebrated. We brought fine flour. We lit the lamps. That might be significant, but then again, it's part of this larger verse about doing other things. In other words, we reclaimed control over the temple. We did all the stuff. And that was the first celebration of our uh, unlikely victory over not just the Greeks, the Seleucid Greeks aren't even mentioned here, but here this letter frames the conflict as an intra-Jewish conflict when we defeated our Jewish enemies, right? We had Jewish kin who were bringing this form of very threatening Hellenism into our lives. We defeated him. Very interesting here who the enemy is. And by the way, 1 Maccabees also presents Judah the Maccabee as primarily focused on other Jews, not the Seleucid Greek. <laughs> We could talk about that if there's time. And so we ask you to celebrate the days of tabernacles in the month of Kislev. Okay, so I'm totally unclear. There's no explanation of why they're calling it this in the year 188. In other words, in 124 BCE. So we had this crazy thing happen to us. We defeated Jason. We told you 20 years ago to celebrate this reclamation of, of the temple and uh, this defeat of Jason and his followers. And the implication here is we're not convinced that you've actually been properly celebrating the holiday. So please, we've given you 20 years. You've had 20 chances. And now we're asking you, can you please celebrate the Days of Tabernacles in the month of Kislev? <laughs> Historical documents are great resources for throwing shade. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, right? So there's like really solid passive aggressive language in this letter. And again, scholars do think that this is an authentic letter. So in other words, if you were going to write an ancient letter, or if you lived in ancient times and you were to write a letter, it was not uncommon to copy it. It's so that you would have your own personal copy. Uh, so we don't know the extent to which this was circulated throughout Egypt. But um, even if it didn't enjoy high circulation, it was likely that the Judeans kept a copy and it ends up in the hands of a scribe probably working in Egypt in the first century BCE who's copying over two Maccabees. All right. I would like to save questions and discussion for the end because I'm a little bit behind. It's already 2.40 and I want to do the second letter. But are there any questions um, in terms of something that you don't understand or that I wasn't clear about? All right. So let's talk about the second letter. So this is a really complicated letter. The first one was pretty straightforward. We told you 20 years ago, please celebrate this holiday. Doesn't seem like you have, please do it. See you later, and may God forgive you for your sin. Now, we have letter number two. This letter, it's 
much, much longer. I'm just going to scroll down so you can get a sense of how very long it is. And this letter is very significant because it seems to contain the oldest allusion to a miracle associated with fire. And so, um, well, let's just start reading. Again, we have um, an introduction here. The people in Jerusalem and in Judea, the Council of Elders and Judah, all the people. And here, could this be Judah Maccabee? Probably not. Um, but we don't know for sure. I mean, if it was Judah Maccabee, it would be much earlier, right? So the people in Jerusalem and Judea and the Council of Elders and Judah were all writing to who? A Jew named Aristobulus, a good Jewish name. He was a very powerful Jew. He's identified in this letter as a tutor of King Ptolemy. That would not have been so unusual. We do know, again, that there were very influential and powerful Jews in Egypt. And this Aristobulus might have been famous, like a, I was going to say Jared Kirshner. No, I'm not going to make any contemporary analogs. Just a very politically high-ranking Jew in Egypt. Um, and uh, he's a member of the stock of the anointed priests. Now, and then the letter goes on to say, but we're also addressing all, all Jews in Egypt. It's very significant that Aristobulus is identified as the descendant of a priest. Think about it. Use a little bit of reader response theory. If you're Aristobulus, put yourself in his mind, and you know that you come from a priestly Jewish family, and you receive a letter from Jerusalem uh, Jews who are um, in charge of the temple, and you're identified as a priest, what's, what's the implication here? Aristobulus, you have been shirking your priestly duty. We know you're a priest and you're hanging out in Egypt when you should be in Jerusalem. Let's see, this theme keeps coming up and up. The responsibility of the priest to lead the people towards uh, the right direction comes up throughout the letter. So I don't think it's a mistake that they choose a priest uh, to uh, direct this, this letter to. And they say, greetings and wishing for wishes for good health, having been saved by God from great perils. We thank God greatly as befits men who war against a king. All right, this is much more normal in terms of the opening blessing, right? Remember the other letter had many sentences. Um, and so this is just a brief little blessing. And that is much more typical stylistically of Hellenistic uh, epistolary letter writing practices. And then they have a little, um, it's not little, but they have this introductory paragraph I'm not going to spend so much time on, but it recounts the miraculous death of Antiochus, Antiochus for Epiphanes. And this account, Antiochus dies by falling through a trap door. Hellenistic writers really loved trap doors. They thought that they were really cool. You can imagine that in ancient, um, I don't like saying ancient, I don't know why I've been saying that. Uh, let's see, in Hellenistic uh, performances and plays, trap doors were a very doable trick to entertain the audience and so uh stages would often have sort of a, a false floor where you could fall through the floor and uh you can imagine also that um maybe there was an idea that this version of his death which is not corroborated i don't think it in one maccabees was performed maybe i don't know but in any case this recounts the miraculous death of antiochus he goes to a temple and he uh he dies falls through a trap door okay the point is, is that God delivers the evil doers. And we're about to celebrate, by the way, P.S., the 25th of Kislev, the purification of the temple. Unclear. Is this the name of the holiday or is this just the day upon which the temple is purified? It does seem that this is the name that they're giving the holiday because it shows up at the end. Again, we want to let you know that this holiday is coming up so that you might celebrate it. As when Nehemiah, the builder of the temple and the altar, brought sacrifices. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Very, very confusing. Why are we talking about Nehemiah? What does Nehemiah have to do with the restoration of the temple in 164 BC? This truly does not make any sense, right? Um, what the authors are going to argue is that the true origins of Hanukkah are not merely about the successful war between the Hasmonean rebels and the Syrian Greeks, but are actually about a series of miraculous events that God does for the people who come back to Judea. And that if you push your way back into the shadows of history, you will find many events in which the people make sacrifices, not literal, but they make sacrifices to go back to the land of Israel. And God rewards that return with divine favor and sometimes miraculous intervention. And so Hanukkah, to truly understand it, 
the author say, is not only about the war in 167 to 164. That war is merely a culmination of many events in which God shows Jews in the land of Israel special favor. And if you understand that, diaspora and Jews in Egypt, you'll understand that this holiday actually has something to do with you. Because we're talking about your ancestors, not only those in our generation or our parents' generation. Okay. And so we go to Nehemiah. Now, the story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is very hard to date. An academic's debate is the 5th, 4th century BC. But I'm not going to have an academic discussion about when Nehemiah came back from Persia to Judea, because I'm interested in what the authors of this letter think. And they put Nehemiah at the very, very, very end of the Babylonian exile. And this would be much earlier than when scholars date Nehemiah, but we don't need to worry about that right now. Because for our purposes, Nehemiah is the person who gathers the Judeans from Babylonian exile back to the land of Israel. And let's just look at the letter. When our forefathers were being carried off to Persia, the priests, so again, we have priests being the leaders, being the protectors, uh, the conservators of the ancient ancestral tradition. The priests, what do they do? They took fire from the destroyed first temples. The temple in 586 BCE is in ashes. And as the Judeans are leaving, they're forced out of Jerusalem at the end of the first temple period. They're being dragged to, to, uh, to, to Babylonia. Some priests take some fire that was on the ground, I guess, some ashes, and they hide it in a pit and they they just hide it. Now, Nehemiah knows about this hidden fire. And when 70 years or whatever later, they he's leading Judeans back to Judea. He says, oh, we got to find that fire because I know that my ancestors in 586 BCE hid that fire. And now I'm going to send priests to recover it. And so they go back to Judea. Nehemiah instructs his priest, you got to go get, go to the cave and find the fire because we're going to use that fire to rekindle. We're going to build the temple and then we're going to um, maybe b bring sacrifices using that fire or we're going to somehow, uh, you know, put it into the temple. So the priests go look for the fire, but they don't find fire. They find a viscous liquid. Tar. Imagine melting tar on a very hot day. I can't imagine anything hot because I'm in Chicago in December. But imagine viscous liquid. So Nehemiah orders the priest. All right, this is what we have. We don't have fire. We have viscous liquid. You know what? Let's see what happens if we put it on an altar. They build an altar. They put the viscous liquid on top. And they wait for the sun to shine, right? Maybe it's a cloudy day. The clouds part. The sun shines down onto the altar. Lo and behold, it ignites, right? In the sun, it had been covered covered by clouds, but the sun, be sun begins to shine. A great shire blazes up to the astonishment of all. This, my friends, might be the earliest allusion to a miracle associated with fire and Hanukkah. Now, it takes place in the setting, right, in the life of Nehemiah, but it's being deployed to tell the Egyptian Jewish readers that they have an obligation to view the significance of this holiday as something that pertains to them and that is much, much more ancient than the conflict between Seleucid Greeks and Judean Jews. So this was a great miracle. Again, maybe this happened in, I don't know, the 520s BCE. And everybody's very excited. They realize this is a miracle. So uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah has his buddy priest, Yonatan, Jonathan, give a song of thanksgiving and lead the people in prayer. So Jonathan, remember, this is a letter, right? We don't know that this is history. We don't know that this actually happened. But think about this in the minds of the writers who are producing this in 124, or no, this is 103 BC. And so they're telling, there are a lot of layers here, but they're telling Egyptian Jews that in the time of Nehemiah, Jonathan uttered a prayer to God to thank God for this miracle of miraculous ignition on the site of the temple. And this prayer is very strange. I have to up my pace a little bit, it's 2.50. Um, so the prayer is very, very strange. You would expect a prayer of Thanksgiving, but look at this. Lord, Lord, God, creator of all, awesome and powerful and just and merciful, et cetera, et cetera, the preserver of Israel from every exile, the one who chose and sanctified the patriarchs. All right. I mean, it's pretty lengthy, but okay. Accept our sacrifice for the sake of all your people, Israel. Guard your portion, make it holy. Gather together our dispersion. Now, this group, they've come back to Judea, right? 
Free those who are enslaved among the nations. Look upon those who are despised and abominated. This doesn't make sense. Why would you have a prayer of petition when you should be having a prayer of thanksgiving? They should just say, thank you, God, very much and have a nice day. But instead, they're saying, you know what, God, thank you so much for that interesting miracle where you ignited a viscous liquid on the site of the Temple Mount. But also, can you please gather the despised and the abominated? Because we're not really satisfied with what you did, God, until you gather all the diaspora and Jews from the four corners of the earth and bring them back to the land of Israel. Now, what's the message that Aristobulus, the priest in Egypt, is getting when he reads this? The message is, God is waiting for you. We are waiting for you. Back in, you know, 300 years ago, we were praying for you to return. Where have you been? We've been waiting and you haven't been coming. And we've been praying on your behalf. Anyway, the, this keeps going and uh, I want to skip ahead. I, I want to just show you the layers of this letter. After the writers describe the miracle that was done for Nehemiah, the writers push uh, the story back into even older times. And they state, well, this holiday of Hanukkah, of purification, it's not only about the miracle that God did for Nehemiah that was a sign that God wanted all Jews in Judea building the temple. But in fact, it goes back to the time of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah lived between, let's say, in the, he starts prophesying in the 620s BCE, and he is prophesying through the end of the first temple period in the 586. So this is the late first temple period. Okay, so you have to sort of, you're going backwards in your mind from Nehemiah, which is the 530s, 520s BC, according to this letter, back to Jeremiah, 100 years earlier. And guess what? Remember when we told you that Nehemiah knew that priests who were going into exile hid the fire? Well, that was none other than Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is not merely a prophet, by the way, Jeremiah is a priest. And so again, you have the theme of priests taking care to ensure the return of Judeans back to the land of Israel in such a way that they can reestablish their temple. So the war of the Hasmoneans is just a culmination of the series of these events. So Jeremiah is the one who commanded those who are being led into exile to take some of the fire, as we have told you, and, and on and on and on. And then talks about how Jeremiah uh, found a cave and he hid all the vessels of the temple and he blocked up the entrance and and afterwards, there's some corruption in the letter, which means that we're missing some lines, that there's some elision with scribal activity. They might have missed some lines, but we'll, the version of this letter that we have is missing lines. But there's reference back to Solomon establishing the temple on the site, of course, of the temple map. And there's even reference to Moses. The point is that the writers are pushing the significance of the temple mount. And how that is the focal point of God's covenantal relationship with people and pushing it back into the early second temple period, back into the late first temple period, back into the moment that Solomon builds the temple, back into the days of Moses. So whatever you're going to celebrate, the writers are saying, you're celebrating God's historic commitment to the establishment of a holy place. And where are you? You're in Egypt. Why are you there? Come back. Do you need any more evidence that God wants you to be here? We write to you and as much as we're about to celebrate the purification, celebrate the days. God who saved us and die are people and restore the heritage to us. Also the kingdom, the priesthood, again with the priests. We hope in God that he'll speedily have mercy on us and gather us together. That's a typo. From the land under the heavens to his holy place. He has indeed delivered us from great evils and has purified his place. It's of utmost importance to these Judeans, that their kin in Egypt celebrate the purification as an acknowledgement of the centrality and exceptionalism of the land of Israel. We have just a few minutes, <laughs> right? That's what I call the come home Jews, Susanna, the come home Jews. My friends who make Aliyah, they say, why aren't you home? Uh, but we can talk about dual loyalty uh, in a few minutes. I just want to say very uh, quickly a few words about the colophon of Greek Esther. So you might know that um, in the early first century BCE, Jews in, well, you might not know, but Jews living in Jerusalem translated the Hebrew version of Esther into Greek. And they did so um, for Greek-speaking Jews. This version of Esther is very, very different than the Hebrew version. It 
seems to want to solve problems in the Hebrew version. In other words, where the Hebrew version has no references to God or prayer or the observance of ancestral law, Greek Esther has all of that and more. So it's one of these ironic situations where the Greek version seems to be much more pious and the Hebrew version. Uh, my personal opinion is that by solving all the problems, you're actually not pulling the reader in, in a way you're, you're distancing yourself from the reader. Hebrew Esther is lovely because you're, you're forced to engage in the story by asking questions. I don't know that I have any questions when I read Greek Esther, but what I want to point you to is the very, very, very end of Greek Esther where we have a signature line and this signature line is called a colophon. We get very lucky when there's a colophon. This is information about the writer uh, that's inserted at the end of an ancient document. And I want to just um, point you towards these little lines that seem to be boring and uninteresting. But the Greek version of Esther tells us something very interesting, I think, uh, about Judea diaspora relations. It says in the fourth year of the reign of Ptolemy and Cleopatra, this would be a husband, wife, brother, sister, queen, king. But actually, we have three brother, sister, wife husband, queen, king, call me Cleopatra. But this one is probably in 76 BCE. So in the fourth reign, in the fourth year of the reign of Ptolemy and Cleopatra, Dositheus, a Jew, who said he was a priest, again, we get the priest theme, and Levite, and his son Ptolemy brought this Greek version of Esther to Egypt from Jerusalem. And they said it was authentic, and they said it was translated by a Jew named Lysimachus, son of Ptolemy a different Ptolemy, one of the residents of Jerusalem. Why is this interesting to me? We actually tend, I think, to think about Hanukkah and Purim or books about Hanukkah and the book about Purim as totally different, right? Hanukkah is all about Judean nationalism and exceptionalism and the centrality of the land of Israel. And Esther's about diaspora and survival. And those are both important, legitimate, maybe unrelated messages. Uh, but for Judean leaders in the early first century BCE, these stories and these holidays that were new and still malleable were about the same thing. They were about diasporan commitment to ancestral laws as those laws were determined by Judean authorities. So whereas the Hebrew version of, of Esther has a current of influence that moves from the diaspora and then reaches the land of Israel, right? The story is takes place in the diaspora. It doesn't mention the land of Israel. The Greek version of Esther, ironically, is the version that switches the current of influence by grounding the authority of Purim in the role of these, these uh, Levites and priests who authorize the book and authorize the holiday. The writers say, oh, you think that you keep Purim and you read the story of Esther? as a diasporan story that legitimizes your lives. No, no, no. The only reason why you keep that is because we said that you can, and we said that you should. They're reversing the current of influence. Um, and so I think ultimately all of these texts, which can be dated to the late second century, early first century BC, reflect a lot of Judean anxiety. And the Judean anxiety has to do with how are we going to maintain cohesion where it is clear to us we are no longer living in a situation that we can expect all Jews everywhere to return to the land of Israel. And with that reality, how do we ensure Judean exceptionalism? How do we ensure devotion to the temple? How do we make sure that we, um, that we maintain unity? And uh, I've, I've come very, very close to the end of my time here. So I do want to open this up to conversation. I'm sure that there's a lot of different questions or comments that you might have. And again, I would be very glad to send you the source sheet if you send me an email. But any thoughts or questions? So I would like to. Your hoodie is my name. The very first intro to the first letter sounds very much like who you're talking about, Benu Batorato, your same movie, Benu Abba, Toba, Yurato. I'm sorry. Just in case people don't know, maybe if you could just translate. Well, it's the translation sounds exactly like what the hell it is. The, the end of the world, the young goer. The very end, oh. as he introduces the hero, Soma Fanecha, and then it, 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 it uses phrases that are so similar to the ones in the beginning of that first letter of yours that it's yeah. hard to think it's a coincidence. So this, so this is really interesting because the liturgy was probably 
probably did not become normative until much later. But there is a lot of liturgy in the second temple period. And a lot of the Judean liturgy sounds like this. So I personally have not collated all the liturgical passages that come from Judea at this time. But I think it would be a really interesting project. Because what I have seen is that diasporan liturgy or the kind of liturgical material that's produced outside the land of Israel never asks for a restoration of the exiles. That's very, to me, that's very uh, remarkable. Um, I also want to say, I see someone asking me to email them. I'm sorry, I'm not going to, but if you could email me just because I can't right now, like copy your email address, but I, I, lean at her, I, I promise I will, uh, I, I will respond if you send me an email. Thank you for understanding. Um, any other questions? Malka, did you just say the liturgy from Judea never asked for restoration of the exile? Oh, no, no, no. The liturgy, the, litur the, the liturgical material produced outside the land of Israel. In fact, I would just say all material, right? Diasporan texts do not ask for God to put an end to the diaspora. Oh, okay. The only place where you might, might, might see it is three Maccabees, which is actually not a story at all about the Maccabees. Even that book, it stops short. In it, uh, yeah. it stops short of. Um, it, it, it admits that you're more liable to sin in exile, but it does not ask God to put an end to the exile. It's a lot to take in, I know, and I go very fast. And uh, hopefully, this will be on YouTube, and you could um, maybe slow my voice down and watch it in slow motion, which would be regular motion for normal people. Um, so I am sorry. I, I did go fast. Is there any other question for clarity or anything else that I could answer before we say goodbye? All right. Thank you very much. And thank you to Rav Shmuley and to Alex and to um, Rav Yaakov and, and all the organizers. And I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to say a real goodbye. Thank you so much, Dr. Simkovich. Amazing to learn with you. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. <clears throat> Friends, we hope you'll learn with us next week with Stephen Ross who's giving a session on the secret war against hate, American resistance, American resistance to anti-Semitism and white supremacy after 1945. That is next Thursday at one mountain time. Um, and uh, we wish everyone a um, many blessings in 2023, all good things in the coming year. Thank you for joining us and learning with us today and every day. And Dr. Simkovich, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And you can email Alex if you want the source sheet again, she will forward along to you. So don't worry, Malcolm. Thank okay. you so much, everyone. Have a great day.